Hi guys, Sarah here from Highland Haven Australian Shepherds and Highland Haven Dog Training and welcome to episode five of Dog for Thought. Joining me is my co-host, daughter and dog trainer extraordinaire, Sophie. Hi guys. How are you doing today, Soph? Good. So what's been going on in Dogland? Give us an update. Um, well, Journey is definitely pregnant. Well, we say definitely. You can't, it's 99% sure. We're going to get her an x-ray on Friday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and that will give us uh, confirmation and a puppy count. But she certainly is big. Mm-hmm. She's got some big boobies going on. Mm-hmm. And she's uh, definitely rounding off. Yep. She's not as fast with fetch anymore. We can't yeah. really play that with her anymore. So she's like, when we're recording this, uh, she's about seven weeks pregnant. And this is her first time that she's not been able to get every single ball and fetch right yeah. when you she's like the best fetcher out she's of every i mean super fast there's seven of them and she wins every single time yeah so that's a sign for me that that's enough fetch for now mm-hmm. so she gets two more weeks in her pregnancy so now she's going to be on a limited activity schedule which means she'll do all normal activities but anything high energy like fetch or jumping on and off high objects you know i'm, I'm going to discourage just to keep her more comfortable and and keep everybody safe inside yep so what's going on with twiggy well we don't think she's pregnant <sighs> yeah no i'm pretty bummed was like sacrificed our vacation and all this stuff so we could have a double litter and uh twiggy did not get pregnant which is part of we're reading. pretty sure well that that i'm actually even more sure of than than journey is pregnant yeah uh and, but we're gonna do an x-ray for her anyway which will rule out that she is pregnant so we're, we're you know, give us confirmation that there's nobody in there. Yep. And, you know, you should do that when you can, because sometimes they can have really tiny litters, like just one or two pups in there, and they wouldn't show a lot of signs outwardly. Yeah. Uh, and that would be a problem. You'd want to know that. So we're going to give her an x-ray to confirm that she's not pregnant on Friday and an x-ray to confirm that Journey is pregnant. Uh, and then Ruby's coming, going in too, to get some updated blood work for her urinary incontinence right yeah and an update on that she's doing pretty good yeah so i'm, so. I'm glad to hear that mm-hmm. uh, i'm not really sure why twiggy didn't get pregnant this is just one of those things we did artificial insemination with both girls although we bred journey naturally a couple of times but her stud is unproven which means he has never produced a litter before so he's a newbie and although he did you know nine of the ten things correctly he did not actually tie with her when they bred, which means male and female dogs get actually stuck together for anywhere from 10 to 45 minutes after they breed. And he wasn't able to do that part of it. Uh, So we did an artificial insemination after breeding her naturally twice with him, just as a little bit of insurance. Twiggy, on the other hand, doesn't like breeding. No, she doesn't like breeding. So we were just trying to just do the insemination with her. And uh, what was the testing you did to make sure she was like fertile? Well, we did some progesterone testing yeah. on her, which looked good. Looked like she was right in that sweet spot. Yep. And then we did one in vitro. No, insemination. In- insemination. And insemination, this is, you could call this a side-by-side insemination. Both dogs are present. The male dog does actually mount the female dog, but they just collect him from there. So this way Twiggy doesn't have to go through all of the drama of breeding, which she really, really doesn't yeah, like. She does not like it at all. Yeah, so I'm not sure why she didn't get pregnant the only x factor i can think of is that she came into heat early to sync with journey Mm -hmm. so normally twiggy if she would stay on her regular schedule wouldn't have come into heat until sometime this month she came into heat a good two months early uh, because journey had come into heat and usually when they're about two the girls living in the same household will generally sync together so she came into heat a little early. So it could be that this heat cycle was not a fertile heat cycle because of yeah, that. Her she eggs probably didn't drop. Yeah. yeah, her eggs didn't have time to mature between cycles and and all of that. So we scratch our heads and wonder why. But sometimes these things happen. She mm-hmm. did have a beautiful, healthy litter with no issues last time. So we have, you know, good hope for in the future for her. Yep. We'll Hopefully see. she'll come into heat at a good time where it's not inconvenient for us to breed her because I'd like to get another litter. Yeah. Two out of her. And when you say inconvenient, we really mean, you know, there's certain times a year where um, it's just more difficult to have puppies. Springtime puppies are great. People love springtime puppies. They're in the market for them. And we're slower in the winter. So it Mm -hmm. allows us to focus more on them and not be so stressed. 
Yeah, but, um, but all time puppies are not ideal because yeah. so we don't always get to choose. Yeah, but we'll try again next time. Mm -hmm. All right, we should probably get started. No. Yep. <laughs> So today's episode is called The Joys and Challenges of a Multi-Dog Household. So we have definitely a multi-dog household. Oh, we do? I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Wise ass. Uh, yeah, so as you all know, we have eight Australian Shepherds here in this house. Um, and for the most part, I love it. But there's definitely some parts that if I had a perfect world, I could do without. You want to get started? Well, my first pro is is we have a dog for every activity that we might be doing. True. So paddle boarding, we mm -hmm. can take certain dogs and can't take other dogs. Mm -hmm. um, Off-leash biking. Um, yeah, some dogs are great uh, in a place where there's lots of people and dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll take, um, you know, a couple of dogs from the pack when we know it's going to be very busy at the park lots of people and bikes and and kids and whatnot yeah we're going to take a certain number of dogs from the pack for that and then maybe leave home the ones that don't really thrive in those busy situations yeah. mm -hmm. so we have biking twiggy likes to bike with you mm -hmm. we have paddle boarding definitely when we're talking about off-leash stuff or stuff where there's going to be lots of other dogs uh, some dogs do better at that than others meadow remy mm-hmm when people are here mm -hmm. we have certain groups to be out with groups of people that we have because mm -hmm. there's you know a, a variety of personalities within the group some mm -hmm. really love hanging out with new people and others would prefer to stay in the bedroom yep and not be bothered mm -hmm. yeah for sure so we never run out of someone to take somewhere yeah like when we go out when i go out every thursday to pick up our chinese food journey knows that's her time to go in the car with me mm -hmm. no one else goes to the door Nope. Just journey. She says, oh, it's Thursday night. Time to go pick up Chinese. See ya, suckers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my first joy would be, hmm, I got a bunch of them written down here. I would say there's always someone to interact with. Yeah. So I think that if you watch people with their dogs when they only have one dog or two dogs, a lot of the interaction from the person to the dog dog's not necessarily 100 mm percent -mm. enjoying that activity no they're like okay i guess i'll tolerate this <laughs> okay i guess i'll tolerate being smushed on the face you know constantly kissed and hugged and touched i know we've all experienced you know you, you lay on the couch you snuggle up against your dog and what does your dog do they get up and walk, walk away, away. <laughs> they jump down off the couch and go yep. lay on the other side of the room uh, which is entirely their prerogative they're certainly you know is their right to say, nope, I'm not in the mood for this. But if you have eight dogs. They rotate. <laughs> you can always find somebody who's looking for some snuggles. Mm -hmm. So I do love that. Well, for you, they definitely like rotate in the morning. It's like one, like there's always a dog next to you. And it's funny how they take turns. Like they know like, okay, my turn's next. <laughs> you mean like when I'm sitting at yeah. the. And you're like on your computer eating breakfast. Uh -huh. And they like come and sit next to you and you give like five minute pets to like each dog and then they like rotate through that's true and you know usually i have one hand dangling down and that's petting a dog mm -hmm. and the other hand i'm eating with or typing on the computer or whatever and sometimes i don't even know what dog i'm petting i'm not even paying attention it's so second nature mm -hmm. that's also i do that at the dinner table too yeah which you know i'm not sure everybody in thinks that that's polite but i don't know i don't mind the dogs next to me at dinner well i mean training's whatever you perceive right so i guess if it makes you comfortable doing it why not we're like it's not my thing yeah. it's not even my thing sitting at the table and petting them like i like to eat my breakfast and twiggy's just sitting underneath me you mean morning. you like to eat your breakfast and watch your shows yeah. with your airpods in yep and ignore everybody in yes, the room absolutely absolutely <laughs> that's the best part of the day <laughs> i definitely think in my opinion, the biggest pro is them learning new behaviors off of one another, which is kind of a double-edged sword because they can also learn, like, not great behaviors from one another. You mean, like, when a new puppy or a new dog comes mm -hmm. in? When a the new pack. dog comes in the house. Um, it's really nice because if you have everyone sit before going out the door, uh, that puppy's going to be like, oh, I guess we don't run out the door like that. Mm -hmm. Or um, recall is, like, my favorite. It's so much easier to teach recall when... Well, that's true. Mm -hmm, I'll give you that. Yeah. When you're surrounded by, like, three or four dogs and they're all immediately coming back and getting cookies with you, 
the puppy's like, oh, we run back. That's just what we do. So they never learn not to listen to you. That's very true. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. They, they habituate to uh, coming back when called because they see the group do that and they want to yep. be with the group. Yep. For sure. It also is easier to housebreak them simply because <laughs> you could just bring them into a spot in the yard where all the other dogs have pooped or peed. And it just smells like it. And mm-hmm. it's very similar to like their whelping box, right? When we teach them how to go in specific areas mm-hmm. in the whelping box, it's the same concept of like all their siblings are going in there peeing and pooping. And then if you have an older dog and they're outside peeing and pooping, they're, they're like, oh, this is what we do. This is what we do. Yep, um, I, definitely. And we can talk about the cons of that in, mm-hmm. in a bit. Uh, definitely you want to have well-behaved dogs who, who do what you want them to do <laughs> before mm-hmm. you bring a puppy in that situation. Yeah, so the housebreaking is definitely easier. I also think that they learn social skills from their oh, yeah. siblings and parents and whatever is here in the mix. Uh, we were talking about the other day how um, the difference between how Evie has grown up compared to like how her other siblings ha- have grown up or how even Journey grew up. I We talked about how like they mature faster um, mm-hmm. when they're in a group of dogs because they learn certain behaviors, get certain rewards. Um based or they get corrected as well yes right for sure we saw so, that with stevie today mm-hmm. not stevie evie when we walked with stevie mm-hmm. this morning on the training walk that evie came and joined us and she was just completely over the top and unhinged yeah. and rushed up to charlotte one of the training dogs completely overflowing with inappropriate energy and charlotte corrected her and charlotte who is half her size made a point of really correcting Evie over and over again because mm-hmm. Evie just wasn't getting and it. She couldn't calm down. Yeah. So I think, you know, we look at Evie, who is from Journey's uh, litter from 2023. So she's about eight months old. And she she is so sweet and fun-loving. And I think that she is really quite good with strangers. Mm-hmm. So there's that. That's, you know, two-sided, right? Yeah. So I think if Evie was living with us... She might be a little more uh, reserved with strangers. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because she's not, she is so excited to meet new people. On the other hand, if she was living with us, she would have much more mature dog-to-dog skills yeah. because this pack would not tolerate that behavior. Mm-hmm. And well, she would have been corrected all along. But since she has limited exposure to other dogs, her dog-to-dog social skills are lagging. Yeah. So that's interesting. You know, we d- we've never had a, a guardian. This is a dog in a guardian home. So she is still my dog, but she lives with Gianna. Uh, she will be bred uh, when she retires from breeding. Then I sign her over to Gianna. So, uh, and she lives with her for the rest of her life. So this is the first time where we've had so much exposure to one of our puppies that have lives somewhere else who comes back to us so often. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see that. And then we've had a lot of contact with this particular litter Mm -hmm. for, you know, who knows, for whatever reason. We have one here for training, another one coming for training. We did training on one a couple of months ago. Uh, So we know this litter actually pretty well. So it's really interesting to see the difference between each of the dogs based on their situation and what we think they would be like if they lived with us. Yep. Yep. All because of the I mean, even if you look at the difference between Evie and Stevie, you can tell Stevie has more dog to dog social skills because she has a sibling at home. Mm-hmm. And so her coming into a new situation with new dogs, she's much more cautious about mm-hmm. showing certain behaviors. Clearly has been corrected yes, at home. Yes, clearly mm-hmm. has been corrected, clearly ha- understands certain um, social skills where Evie really hasn't besides with our dogs for very short periods of time. Um, and she just comes in there like a rocket and doesn't do anything exactly. right and gets corrected by multiple dogs multiple times. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it's very, very interesting and um, definitely a new way of learning as well yeah. through I human mean, I, eyes. I think I would say Stevie has, is a more, um, has a more typical uh, maturity level for dog-to-dog yeah. skills. Yeah. In, in other words, she's still eight months old. Yes. So she still has lots to learn, but she's more typical, whereas Evie is a little bit behind socially and is over-exuberant and doesn't listen to corrections. And it's not, you know, she's... Uh, playing first and asking questions later. Yes. And to just go back for a second on um, talking about recall, how it's easier to teach them recall in a, in a pack setting like we have when Evie walked with us a couple months ago, I guess at this point, 
Gianna had never taken her off leash, you know, in public, right? She'd always been leashed except in a fenced yard. And we were in a big open field where we walk regularly and we had only our pack, yep. only our own personal dogs. We didn't have any training dogs with us at the time. And uh, I said to Gianna, you can take her off the leash. You're like, I'm not worried about her at all because mm-hmm. I know our dogs will come back and Evie's just going to follow them. Yeah. Uh, so it was a great introduction to off leash with Evie in a way that we felt comfortable that she would not run off. Yep. That she would respond and we could, and then, you know, and then it's a matter of Gianna um, making sure she's reinforcing when she does come, giving her cookies and not always catching her every time she comes, just giving her a pat and then sending her off again and sort of introducing her to off leash in a super positive way so that it doesn't become a problem that we have to fix, mm-hmm. but it's introduced and habituated exactly the way we want it. So that was yep. really a benefit, certainly for Evie at the time. And definitely for Gianna. I feel like it wasn't just Evie learning, it was Gianna learning as well, side by side with her where you know when you have your first dog and they're you're solo by yourself and you're trying to do recall you make a lot of mistakes and then you Mm -hmm. end up having to unwind those mistakes um you know evie was learning and then it was us being like gianna speak up louder call you know have a different version of calling her so she realizes that tone means come back right away right um so it's a it's a nice way to not only for the dog to learn recall but to for the human the new human to learn yeah, how to properly it's definitely a benefit that yeah. she was able to take advantage of on the same uh, uh, in the same thread you know I, I said to Gian at the time I'm glad we got her off leash now yeah um and didn't wait too much longer because mm-hmm. I hadn't realized she'd never really been off leash before because she's still young and impressionable yep <laughs> right yep. we don't want her to be too independent <laughs> the first time we take them off leash yep. we want them to be young and impressionable again so we can set it up correctly right from the beginning so there's not a lot of going back and and fixing the mistakes we made and it's it's funny because we talk about you know you want them to be very impressionable when we first take our new puppies off leash they're like 10 weeks old yeah yeah they're really really young so like (laughs) you know when we talk about young impressionable like something that you built into like their wiring is we do it very young and that's another pro of having a huge pack is you can have very young puppies um, off leash and not worry that like another dog's going to come because you have those big dogs that are going to protect that puppy for the most part. That's true. And um, also we don't, it's not novel. No. So you don't want the first time off leash to be a novel experience. Yes. You want it to be like really like, Oh, it's no big deal. Like it's nothing, no, nothing new. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's fun, certainly fun, but not any more fun than walking on a leash with me. It's just as fun as that. Because if you make it uh, a point of it being super special or unusual, that's when you start to see some mischievous behavior come out. And um, then it can really go awry from there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, full disclosure, we're talking about Australian Shepherds. We're not talking about Huskies. Nope. (laughs) Aussies will naturally stay with you if you don't screw it up. Yep. Right. So if you can, like and we keep repeating this, if you're setting it up correctly from the beginning, you're working with them and their sort of default to not want to run from you. The <laughs> Evie, when we let her off leash, she's literally, literally circled us about 50 times. Yeah, like we should have counted. Huge circle around, 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 around. And that's a real Aussie thing, right? We said this, I think, a couple episodes ago when we said, you know, circling your son. We are the sun. Yep. And, and these are there are satellites sort of or whatever and we're the earth and their satellites mm-hmm. circling us so you know for a dog who has, has a natural default of wanting to stay with you getting them off leash early is really beneficial and easy maybe more beneficial and more important when you have a dog who's not naturally orbiting you yep um like a, a husky or you know a pure any sort of hound like mm-hmm. any dog that is bred to be independent right you know so that's an interesting, we don't do a lot of off-leash um, with our training dogs. Um, Unless they request it. Uh, you know, and when we're off-leash with them, we're in a fenced yard, so it's not true freedom for all obvious reasons. Uh, but it might be a little different when you're talking about a different breed of dog who is naturally more independent and prone to wander. Either their nose t- catches onto something and they wander, mm-hmm. or they're just, you know, tuning you out naturally because that's yep. what they've been bred to do. Mm-hmm. So my next pro would be that they very 
simply entertain each other. Yep, which is nice. Right. So a lot of times when people get a second dog, they get it specifically for this purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want their dog to have a playmate. It doesn't always work out <laughs> like they imagine. <laughs> well, we could talk about that too, proper matching certain behaviors with one another. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. We'll, and we'll cover that when we talk about the cons, which are coming up. Uh, but it is great that they keep each other company when they're not home. Mm -hmm. uh, they play with each other for the most part, along with teaching each other social skills. You know, one of the most popular videos I can put online at any time is just stream of the dogs playing with each other. Yep. It's endlessly fascinating. It's good for them socially. You know, with any in any pack, you have the players and the layers. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> Ty is not much of a player. Mm -mm. He's a real layer. Uh, Ruby, of course, is too old to play at this point anymore. She just like barks. And yeah, she's kind of like the Karen of the group. <laughs> she likes to police everyone. Uh, Twiggy plays quite a bit. She plays with her Vivi mother. Vivi plays quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Deacon and Meadow are siblings. So they play exactly as the siblings play. Yes. Which is fun for the first five minutes. And, and then, then someone then takes it out of Somebody control goes too far and then they get in a scuffle not a scuffle it's a, a little argument yeah. yeah and then they separate and huff and puff and walk away from each other remy's a big player for being 11 remy is a huge player she is she's she is a good player she is she plays with everyone yeah takes that, that huge rope out and drags it around and gets everyone going in the house <laughs> and true. i'm like girl you're starting so much shit and like that's true. Journey's not much of a player. Mm -mm. She does try, but she gets a little bit too serious right from the start. Mm -hmm. So she does play. She's not in the mood to play right now because she's pregnant. Perhaps when she gets spayed down the road, she'll be a bit more of a player. And I think that's probably Twiggy's going to be a little easier to deal with within the pack Yeah, as well. Once well, she we gets hope spayed. so. I hope so. Well, it won't matter because you're moving out that's at some true. point. That's you're not going to live with me forever, are you? No. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> So I have one more, snuggling at night. Yeah, you're right about that. So you sleep with two dogs. Two, sometimes three, depends sometimes on the night. Three, yeah. Yes, but mostly two. Mm -hmm. And I have the other six in my room. And no, you're all thinking, uh, do you sleep with six dogs in the bre on the bed? Not technically. Yeah, but how many do you sleep with? <laughs> so Ty's never on the bed. And who he, else is on the bed? And the other five are on and off the bed throughout the night, which is sort of my point, right? I love to have a dog laying next to me. And they rotate. They naturally rotate because they get overheated very quickly, as do I, but I just I just have a fan blowing on me all the time because they're so hot all the time. Uh, Meadow is almost always up next to me. She's, she's my big partner. Remy, too. I know you sleep with Remy sometimes. Remy's pretty good. She sleeps sort of at the bottom of your body, like yep. down towards your like knees. Like on your legs. She likes mm -hmm. to lay across your legs. Deacon comes on and off the bed. Journey comes on and off the bed. And Vivi comes on and off the bed. So there's never a time when I have no dogs in bed with me, mm -hmm. which it, to me is sort of the definition of heaven. Yeah, I, I feel I feel a little, a little differently. Well, <laughs> your dad feels a little different too yeah. about the dog's in bed mm -hmm. so he has chosen to sleep in his own bed yeah next to mine and gary sleeps in a bed where there's no dogs allowed so we are in the same bedroom but because i love to sleep with the dogs and he does not we have made an agreement after 25 years of marriage that he can have a dog free zone and then the dogs get on and off the bed with me so a little bit unorthodox but it works for us mm -hmm. and it makes me happy yeah yeah, no, I have um, Twiggy and Ruby. And Ruby, I mean, she's on the bed for a little bit, really, like, she has a hard time jumping on the bed lately. So she sleeps on her dog bed on the floor. And then Twiggy's usually on my head the entire night. And then she gets overheated and goes on the floor and then gets back up and goes on my head. Um, yeah, she's a big snuggler, Twiggy. She is a Every time big I snuggler, go in your yeah. room, she's all snuggled up next to you. Yeah, but uh, she definitely has. It's like we both need space, so it's like the perfect amount of snuggling because like I don't want you all over me all the time, which is why also like sometimes I'm like, no, Rem, not tonight because I need some room. <laughs> well, I, I don't have any problem with any of the dogs in the bed provided they follow my rules and they learn very quickly. You know, Meadow used to wake up in the morning. She's an early riser. 
and she used to pant on me and you know for like an hour and it would drive me crazy so I taught her not to do that every time she panted on me I would make her move down to the bottom of the bed and it took about two weeks of consistently reinforcing that and now it's hilarious she does not pant on me so if she gets hot but she doesn't want to move away from me she sits up and pants did you know this I didn't know she sat up yep, I she sat up sits up pants cools herself off and then she lays back down and sometimes she forgets and she'll be like her head will be right like next to the my side of my face as I'm laying on the pillow and she will uh start to pant she'll go <sighs> and stop like <laughs> oh, I'm not allowed to do that she's gonna make me move so uh again yeah some people don't believe in dogs in bed with you I have no problem as long as there are rules and boundaries that, yep. that everybody agrees to and um you know they're good dogs mm -hmm. they understand that yeah no, they're no pretty panting. good about it no panting on me no no panting so those are most of the joys of having a multi-dog household so we should probably move on to challenges I mean we could talk about joys all day uh, but we should probably move on, no? Yeah, it's probably probably close to equal at, at times. No, it's never close to equal. I don't know. Sometimes it's, it's I'm like, 99% uh, joys and 1% challenges. 20% uh, challenges. All right, go ahead. Give me your first challenge. Um, well, kind of going off of they learn new behaviors. They also learn like not great behaviors. True. Like barking. Barking. Like I would have to one. say barking is my number one most challenging behavior yeah. for sure. Because you can't like get upset with them, but also at the same time, it's like, shut up. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get right to the point. Oh, facts, as they would say, as the generation would say. Yes, I think that the barking um, is really challenging because it's not. It triggers the other dogs and really let's break it down who do we have we have two main barkers in this house we have meadow meadow is number Twiggy. one she has the crown the giant crown of barking oh ruby well uh, ruby we'll put that aside for a second the second in line is probably twiggy yeah twiggy gets it gets in these uh, her barks are really habitual so it's like a time of day and mm -hmm. she'll just bark um, and that gets everybody going mm -hmm. and it is very frustrating especially if you're in the middle of doing something um, and they startle you um, or if you're trying to talk on the phone or have a conversation or, or um, just doing this podcast yeah or just <laughs> trying to have a peaceful time it, yeah it's it is challenging for sure Ruby you mentioned does bark but Ruby has that dementia bark you yeah. know Ruby's got a touch of dementia she's old at this point and when she barks it's a high-pitched repetitive bark um, that she has a hard time stopping when she starts. Mm -hmm. uh, that is um, particularly grating to my ear. Oh, man. It, like, hits <sighs> every worst part of your eardrum. But and she does quiet down when she you does. ask her to. Yeah. Um, you know, this has been a point of contention with the four people living in this house because there's different levels of tolerance of the barking. I think I'm the most tolerant out of the four of, of you. Um you know, a lot of the barking is just really natural behavior. It's expected. Meadow is alerting us to something at the door. Mm -hmm. And we get a gazillion Amazon packages every single day. Yep. So, you know, I did buy a sign that I can put down on the driveway that says, please leave the packages here. It's like my worst nightmare when the Amazon or UPS person decides to be nice and bring the package up to the front door because oh. our front doors are glass. I was going to say it's glass. Oh, so it's like what a everyone can see right through it. Mm -hmm. To their benefit, to, to their credit, they bark for a short period of time. Well, it, they're very good at when we say like enough, It you know, they're pretty yeah, good at quieting. They do quieting. settle down. And yeah. so it's, you know, 10 or 15 seconds of barking before it's silence again. But it's repetitive mm -hmm. throughout the day because mm -hmm. we're home all day because we train out of the home. So um, it, it's... It can be challenging and and cause temper flares among the people in this house because it just to us seems so pointless, unnecessary. And you know, and then you know, it isn't it isn't pointless to them. No. So, and then of course, once they get triggered, then they're, it takes they're aroused now, yeah. right? Their arousal level goes up, or at least some of the eight, not all of them, and then they're apt to trigger at an even lesser 
um, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever trigger that they find. Then it's like the bunny outside that is always outside. Or then it's, you know, the neighbor next door who just comes out to scoop his lawn. Like it's like every little thing. super frustrating. And then it takes a while for that arousal level to sort of go down again Mm -hmm. and go back to homeostasis where they can sort of control their excitement a little better. So, you know, you can know everything there is about dog behavior and, and dog training um, and still find <laughs> a behavior like barking so annoying and frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is certainly the case when you have eight dogs of any breed. I mean, I can't imagine having eight dogs of any breed where you don't have somewhat of a barking issue periodically. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is, is like even – like you can have a dog that's just naturally not into barking. Like in the beginning, Twiggy was not a barker for like until Neither she was, was like a year and a half. Jeez, we didn't hear Vivi's voice yeah. for like a year. Nope. And then all of a sudden, it's like a new behavior that comes on, and now we have to like yeah, rewind it. Yeah, <laughs> which is a good thing because you want mm-hmm. them to have you, want you them know to be whole for sure. But at the same time, it's also like, oh, do we have to do barking to make yourself yeah. whole? Like, can yeah. it be something else? Yeah, so. it, it is. It is a. That is definitely my number one challenge. If I could uh, eliminate completely, I would definitely live with all the other challenges and just um, reduce the barking to almost mm-hmm. nothing. That mm-hmm. would be great. Yeah, I agree. But they are what they are, mm-hmm. and we move on and yep. manage. So my ch- uh, challenge would be um, that it's hard to choose the dogs, one or two dogs over another. So. We do walk seven days a week in this house, uh, a combination of training dogs and our own dogs. Uh, When we don't have any training dogs here, then we're just doing our own dogs. Regardless, we can't take eight dogs at one time. Someday, when we have a big, giant piece of property and we can take all eight dogs out, oh, I'll also be horseback in that fantasy, (laughs) and our donkey will come too. (laughs) (laughs) It would be great to take all of our dogs, but that's, it's unrealistic. It's hard for me, to ch- even though we, I know we do them on a logical rotation, I always feel terrible leaving some of the dogs home. I always wish I could bring everybody all the time. You don't feel that way? No. <laughs> no. But I also grew up, grew up with a lot of dogs, so it was always picking and choosing. So it's like, to me, it, it's just fair, which is why I keep track of it, like, to a T, where, like, you are like, wait, who's who are we taking today? I'm like, oh, we're taking so and so, so and so and so and so, and this is the good combination of dogs that we're going to take today, mm-hmm. or whatever. Which is important because certain dogs are going to be more reactive than other dogs in our pack, so we have to take calm dogs with the reactive dogs. And yeah, there's definitely mm-hmm. walking uh, pairs that that work mm-hmm. better together than than others for sure, and it depends on, of course, what other dogs we're walking with as well, or if we're doing off leash stuff because if we're at mm-hmm. like the horse farm that we walk at. Mm-hmm. We're going to take the best recall dogs because there's like horses. They get more freedom. Sure. More freedom. We don't and, have to worry uh, about it. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. Although they're all pretty good off leash. Uh, Meadow is a great off leash dog. Meadow. Well, most of the, the dogs that we have raised are really good off leash. Yeah. Ty yeah. is not good off leash. Vivian well, is not good off leash. All right. Let me, let me clarify that. When we say not good off leash, we mean they don't turn on a dime yeah. and race back to us when we call them. They do come back when you call them but they they, mosey yeah they mosey back yeah which is fine unless there is a a situation where you need them to come back quickly yeah right and uh ty and vivian uh only have one speed Mm -hmm. when they're coming back when they're being recalled and it's you know slow i guess so here i come trot 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 whereas if you call meadow or deacon journey twiggy Mm -hmm. most of the time if she's not feeling mischievous they will literally spin on a dime and come back at Running 800 miles an hour. Running full speed. Yeah, which, you know, that's why I got my leg broken, but that's a whole other story. I mean, but the, the positives of that is that the dogs that are most reactive or most reactive to, like, other dogs and stuff are the dogs that turn back on a dime. That's true. So, like, Deacon turns back on a dime. Twiggy turns back on a dime. So we never really have to worry about them in certain situations. Yes, I wouldn't worry about Ty or Vivian. Or Vivian going uh, up to coming somebody. Coming up to any other no. dog. And plus, they grew up with horses, so it's like. That's true. That's true, but we're getting a little off topic. Yeah, we are. My point is, it's hard to choose. Mm -hmm. I feel bad leaving dogs home. Even though I know it's logical and everyone gets a turn, I still feel bad. I want want to keep everyone together all the time, but that's just me. I guess in the grand scheme of things, 
maybe that's just a problem with me and everybody else is fine. <laughs> so I think one of my biggest ones is having guests over. That's that's always been tricky yeah, in our household, yeah. especially with the Aussies. Not as much when we had like little dogs. Mm-hmm. But with the Aussies, it's like a whole spiel, especially if they're not dog people. Then it's like a whole thing. Well, because be specific, because we have to put them away or because they're noisy or like what what part of it? Um, Moving around like our guests moving around freely like they if we have all the dogs out, it's we always have we're in training mode. We're not in like yeah. hanging out, relaxing yeah. with our friends mode. And then this is where I feel guilty is I want everyone to be in the room yeah. be- and I want them to see what we see when we interact with our dogs. But they're not able to because our dogs are not holding them prisoner. Yeah, essentially in the chair that they're in. Yeah, because if anybody stands up, if you have herding dogs, it's very typical for them to trigger when people move so uh, that they're uncomfortable with. So if it's somebody they don't know well, and um, they come over and you know they're seated at the table or on the couch or whatever, and they go to stand up, that will trigger our dogs to mm-hmm. bark. Well, some of our dogs to bark, and th- therefore all of our dogs to bark. And then it scares the guests, and then yeah, it's like that, a whole thing. So we don't generally do that. We don't generally have all of our dogs out when people are over, except for a very, very few people who we know our dogs are great with. And one of them is our old uh, work group. Yep. And that's, like, it's what, about four four people, five people? Uh, four, four people. I guess it's four people, because there's six of us all together, yeah. right? Four people. So that is the one shining moment. When they come yeah. over, all the dogs can be out at the same time. Not Ruby because she can't be in the group because she has made enemies in the group. But she's in the room just behind the fence. Well, and they all make an effort to go over there and say hi to her. And, you know, they're they're able to freely walk around. And they, when the dogs do bark, they don't get nervous. They just walk right through them like it's not a big deal. And then the dogs are like, oh, we're not trying to scare you or whatever. Like, we're yeah. not going to hurt you. We're not going to get away with this. So it's not a big deal, and it's much more pleasant. Uh, but mainly it's because they're super comfortable with those four people, like yeah. super comfortable, all eight dogs, which is unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of our dogs know a particular person better than others. They have more experience with them. Um, yeah, so when, when the old work group comes over, that's always um, particularly sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's great for the dogs. It's great for us. Um, that always makes me happy when they come over. Yeah. So having guests over, yeah, that's difficult. But do you think it would be less difficult if we had fewer dogs? Yeah. <laughs> I, I do. I wanted the answer to be no. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> I mean, I think like. So like what number of dogs would you think would that would be easy with? Uh, four. Oh, really? Four? Yeah. I think four is a magic number. Yeah. Four. That's boring. Well, I, for psycho- you, it's what boring. What kind of psychopath only wants four dogs? <laughs> average person <laughs> i think four is reasonable that's what i say to that i mean think about when we had four dogs it was like chill no we needed more no because it was what was it ruby remy meadow and ty that's like a perfect combo right there the ogs man it's so funny you're just spoiled because you've had a multi-dog yes. household your yeah, whole it's, life it, i have had different experiences than you did sarah So one of my uh, challenges is the mess. The dog hair is unhinged. Mm -hmm. Seasonal. I feel like on seasons Uh, it's worse. Yeah, well, definitely. Definitely when they're all blowing their coats, I want to jump off a cliff. Yeah. Um, But even when they're not blowing their coats and I try to keep a very clean house, there is still dog hair everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and not, not only that, but just the amount of dirt that they bring in just because, mm-hmm. you know, they're outside and they bring in dirt and we have wood floors, which is wonderful. I love them. But every time I hear a Scooby-Doo, uh, scratching mm-hmm. as, as somebody takes off down the, you know, the hallway, I think, oh, my wood floors, oh, yeah, oh my wood floors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they, they, it, there is a lot of wear and tear certainly on the house. That being said, you know, I wouldn't have gotten eight dogs had I not known that that was going to happen. And yeah. that's just part of living with them. Mm-hmm. And it just means more cleaning for us. I sometimes think what it must be like to clean a house that doesn't have dogs in it. Like, you must not have to do it very much. Right. <laughs> wouldn't it be awesome? 
I get a lot of questions on how well, my how I keep the house clean with so many dogs, and just to go over it, I have a an iRobot vacuum, yeah, the, the automatic little AI vacuum. So I run that pretty much every day. That doesn't do a perfect job. That just keeps it down to a dull roar. Uh, I then use a real vacuum once a week and thoroughly, I mean, thoroughly, thoroughly vacuum once a week and mm -hmm. then mop once a week. So it's really not that I clean, clean, clean all day long, but it is definitely something that you can't um, skip. No. You can't just say I'm tired this week. And there's also so much dog hair in my bed. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't like when Twiggy blows her coat when after she has like puppies or whatever. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, the amount of dog hair that's in my bed. I guess that's a con to like having them sleep in your bed too. Yeah. The amount of dog so. hair yeah. is like insane. Then you're like breathing in the middle of the night and you're like because <laughs> you're choking on <laughs> it hair. It is crazy. And you're like, oh, come the on. dog hair is crazy. I mean, to me it's a small price to pay, but mm -hmm. um, it definitely is a lot of work. And and I decided when I was, you know, as I started getting more and more dogs, I just was not going to live in a house that looked like there was eight dogs living no. in it. Uh, when we sold our last house, you know, it was a much smaller house, and we had six dogs, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who came to look at it, none of them knew that there were six dogs living no. in that well, house. Well, besides the run, we had that really nice run. Well, the backyard's a little different, yeah, for sure. But that's a con, the yard. Yeah, that's a big con. Yeah, yeah. They're not well, only did I, they destroy the inside of your house, but they the also outside destroy the outside. The house. Not intentionally, no. but just you know, running up and down the hill when they go out the back door, um, and keeping it clean, doing the scooping, yep. all the scooping, and then whatever we have, um, the concrete, we have to like power wash that like mm -hmm. for every four months, and then if it's like. Snow, so seasonal, right? So when it's muddy outside or Ugh. spring, like right now, our backyard is in the house. so muddy. Yeah. So they come in and it's like a whole muddy mess, and mm -hmm. um, it it just takes a lot longer time. And yeah, yeah. no, they're definitely definitely wear and tear in the house yep. for sure. Another con for me is we're always training them, always training them. They're always coming up with some new behavior. That's see, that's not a con for me. That's a con for me. I mean, I that's just the default. I enjoy that. I enjoy the mental stimulation. It depends on what we're training them with. Like, no, I definitely when it's think like a weird behavior, I'm like, come on. Like, yeah, no, why I definitely are you think yourself? that you would like more downtime. Yes. I don't need the downtime. I like the constant, I don't want to say challenge because that makes it too dark, mm -hmm. but the constant pushback from them, you know, I, I love that. that well, we, you, you know that I get bored super easily. Very easily. <laughs> I need constant stimulation. Yes. And they certainly feel that for me. So that's not a con for me, but go ahead, expand. Yeah, like like Twiggy getting into these weird habits or like she deciding that like she doesn't like Journey right now or she doesn't like Deacon right now or she doesn't like Vivi right now and then having to like be like, okay, you need to like chill out. Like I don't know what your issue is. I think, I think that's a youth thing for you. Yeah. I just think it's that you're young. I think as you age, you just get mellower about that. Maybe after you raise your own children, you just yeah. get mellower about that. I feel like kids are like a whole different ball game. So well, they they're not a different ball game. They're just a a lot. Like, it's a lot more investment compared to like say little league to the major leagues. That's the difference yeah, between guess. raising a dog and raising kids. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just my age, or no no. I don't think it's my age. I I think that I have always liked that that interaction you get from constantly having to work with them. I mean, certainly there are times when I'm like, can you guys just please just go lay down and leave me alone? For sure. You know, because I'm human. But mm -hmm. I like that. I do. Yeah, I don't like it. Well, I guess, <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's like the same stuff with like puppies. That like maybe in the beginning, it's teaching them need, yeah. every mm -hmm. little detail. And I'm like, oh my gosh. It's all consuming. <sighs> I like that it's all just consuming. be grown up already. So you just listen to me. <laughs> So the only time I don't like it, and I could do my last challenge, uh, is when we go on vacation. Yeah, that's a that's a big one for you also. That yeah, doesn't bother me at all. It's very stressful for me to leave because it's there's a very few people in this world who can come and handle these dogs for a week while we're away where I think they're going to get the proper care and I don't have to worry about them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about them, but I still do. Yeah. So I definitely have some serious anxiety for the first two days or so of vacation remember last time yeah go ahead talk about it <laughs> it's so funny 
when I woke up, I think the second night of being away, and I had a dream that, uh, what was the dream that the yeah. dogs were that that, that G- Gianna, Gianna died. had died, and that there was nobody to take care of the dogs. <laughs> And they were stuck in the crates, and they were starving to death. And I was like, "Poor Gianna. We you don't know, even know I, how I, she died." I didn't care about Gianna. <laughs> I was just worried about the dogs. That's the funny part. Yeah, that's the worst that's part. Not what the do fact you? That Gianna died. Yeah, Gianna <laughs> died, and my dogs and blah, blah blah. And I was like, "Poor Gianna. <laughs> the dogs will be. The dogs would survive without food for a week, and we would come back, and you know, we would feed them, and it would be fine." But poor Gianna literally died. That's the, that's in the ironic dream. part. In, in your like, dream. Be, in your dream. Clear, in my nightmare. Yes, in your nightmare. So, uh, yeah, that was funny. Of course, I knew how silly that was, but it didn't stop me from texting Gianna and just being verifying that she was alive and the yeah. dogs were And okay. then when we got back, I ranted to her about how funny it was because we had to tell her the story. And she is amazing at taking care of the mm-hmm. dogs. And Monica took care of them. Yep. Uh, she did an amazing job. There's very, very few people who can handle them, but those two women certainly can. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I'm not sure they love doing it. No. They do it, I think, because they love us they love us i mean they certainly get paid too but i think mostly because they love us and mm-hmm. they'll they'll do those things for us but you know it's it gets harder and harder with the dynamics within the pack mm-hmm. right and we, we didn't even really touch on that the dynamics are always changing in the pack between each other and you have to just really be on your toes and and know them and I guess no. that that's maybe what I'm talking about with the always training them. Like it, there's always some new drama that, you know, so and so aren't getting not really. OK, when I say not getting along, it's just more of like them having little arguments about certain random things. So like Ty will be addicted to the ball one day and then and anybody who like tries to take his ball, he's like, that's my ball, blah, blah. blah. And then it's like a whole little thing yeah. or so pack dynamics. Yeah. Again, that's not a con for me. No, it's a con <laughs> for me, though. I feel like they should stay linear. I find it endlessly fascinating. Maybe I'm just designed for lots of dogs because I find that the ever-changing pack dynamics endlessly fascinating. Um, I don't like it when they get in serious fights. Oh, well, yeah, that's the worst. That is very traumatic, and we've had uh, you know a handful of serious mm-hmm. fights over the years. Um, that is unavoidable mm-hmm. if you're going to socialize, you know, multiple dogs in a household. For and they're intact. For over a long period of time. Yep. The intact uh, part, boys, that when, when they were intact was certainly um, part of the problem, for sure. Mm. But then even like Journey and Twiggy, then Journey being and Twiggy intact, get to they yeah, have so their own little thing. That And that is stressful. That is yeah. stressful. I don't like that aspect of it at all. However... That is just part and parcel of having a big, group of any, a big group of animals of any kind together. Yeah. You're going to have disagreements. We've been very lucky in that, you know, for the most part, this pack gets along great. And we've learned from the dif- disagreements that they've had. Like we learned a lot from the disagreements that they've had. Yeah, I think that's why I, I don't find it a con, you know, for the most part, because uh, with every incident that happens, and it's not often that the, the bad stuff happens, but we've been doing this a long time. Um, I always learn something. Mm -hmm. It's never for nothing. I always try to learn something from it. And we do have very strict management uh, protocols. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vivi is never uh, allowed to be alone in the pack when we're not home. Like, uh, out of the pack, she has to be crated. It's not even just that. Any new dog that we did not raise since they were a puppy have to be crated at all times. When when we're we're not not home. home. Yeah. Uh, Deacon has also proven himself untrustworthy. So he has to be crated when we're not home. I don't trust him you know unsupervised with the whole group of dogs you know there's only a few dogs that i i let sort of i don't worry about them when i'm gone meadow, meadow is one of them yep meadow is number one yeah for sure she, she gets along with everybody yep and it's just it's for their own good to keep them safe mm-hmm. and that's really our job is to set them up for success yep. rather than failure and we've learned over the years that um you know we've been reminded over the years that, that they they're animals, animals yep. and that you can't control everything. Nope. And you don't really know everything, you know, about this as is is an independent and intelligent living creature. You don't control everything about them. Mm-mm. So what we can control is the environment and have a good management plan in place so that everybody stays safe. And we learn their, their behaviors and their language, you know, of like, okay, this body language means this. This body language means that. I and think we've gotten a lot better with that. We've learned that, like people, they don't, they're not static creatures. They're forever changing mm-hmm. as well. Always they're, evolving. They're going through their own 
lifetime of maturation where things change mm-hmm. just like people do different stages of their lives and at different stages of their lives they need different things from us yep. and from their pack members and things that they don't tolerate anymore yep and um, that goes through like everything we've talked about pros and cons um they're always changing they're always evolving they're always readjusting even if like, we talk about fetch like they go through waves on like who's best at fetch mm-hmm. who's not good at fetch who used to be good at fetch who doesn't want to play fetch anymore mm-hmm. who just runs around and barks <laughs> so yeah, if we just talk about even just fetch in general it kind of overflows into everything because they're That's always true. changing they are always, always changing. evolving yeah it's um, like uh, a head of a pride of lions right a big male they, they never stay in power very long nope <laughs> they come and they go so that's uh, definitely fetch. The, the, the king of fetch is ever changing. Yep, it's journey right now. It is journey. Well, not, not right this minute since no. she's got a belly full of puppies. But yes, certainly the young ones have the advantage. Yep. So we should probably wind it up. Yep, 50 minutes later. I guess, I guess this is just another topic we can talk about endlessly. Mm-hmm. I hope uh, some of you guys found it entertaining, if nothing else. (laughs) Uh, Not everybody is cut out for um, a multi-dog household. Um, And I feel sorry for you. No, just kidding. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Way to end the podcast. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Sophie and I, whenever we're we're on our training walks and we see somebody walking without a dog, I always say, what kind of psychopath takes a walk without a dog? Obviously a serial killer. (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) You would never catch me out walking without a no, dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, a uh, multi-dog household is not for the faint of heart, for sure. But if you are one of the chosen ones, it, it can be a lot of fun, endlessly mm-hmm. entertaining. Yep. And if you pay attention, you will learn a lot. Yep. So that's it for episode five. Yes. Wow. Episode five. Um, do you enjoy this? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I like this one, too. At first, we thought we weren't going to have enough to talk about 15 minutes later. Yep. Blah, 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 We blah, actually blah. don't have a lot in common with this topic, so it's <laughs> interesting, too. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were going to agree on everything, but no, not the case. But, you know, that's what makes people individuals as well, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want you to know that I will be personally disappointed in you if you do not have a multi-dog household when you move out. I'm going to have, like, <laughs> three. In the average number. I will disown you. I'll have to wear a bag over my head. Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to have eight. I'm sorry. I love you. But, like, I feel like three. I'm going to have kids. I can't have eight dogs and two kids. All right. I'll. Yeah. All right. I, I I'm going to have to. If I have eight dogs, they're going to have to all be, like, chihuahuas I guess or something. I will still love you, even if you don't have a gazillion dogs. Mm-hmm. I don't know about. How about you, Jacob? Will you, will you have a lot of dogs? Hmm. He says probably. They're mm-hmm. all going to be dachshunds. They're all going to be short little legs, like a corgi and a <laughs> dachshund, and a little cat with little legs. That's, I guess maybe your wife would have some say in that. Anyway. All right. So that's it for episode five of Dog for Thought. Thanks for joining us as always. We've gotten so much nice feedback, and I've really enjoyed doing this. So thanks for listening again, guys. And we will see you next time on Dog for Thought. Dog for Thought is written and hosted by me, Sarah Brown, co-hosted by Sophie Brown, produced, edited, and original music by Jacob Brown. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye.